Chapter Thirteen, Part One of the Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter Thirteen, The Sullen Retreat, Part One. Harry, like the rest of the army, slept soundly through the rest of the night, and they rose to a brilliant first day of June. The scouts said that the whole force of Fremont was not far behind, while the army of Shields was marching on a parallel line east of the Massanuttons, and ready at the first chance to form a junction with Fremont. Youth seeks youth, and Harry and Dalton found a little time to talk with St. Clair and Langdon. We've broken their ring and passed through, said Langdon, but as sure as we live we'll all be fighting again in a day. If the Yankees follow too hard, old Jack will turn and fight em. Now why haven't the Yankees got sense enough to let us alone and go home? They'll never do it, said Dalton gravely. We've got to recognize that fact. I'm never going to say another word about the Yankees not being willing to fight. They're too darned willing, said Happy Tom. That's the trouble. I woke up just about the dawn, said Dalton. Everybody was asleep but the general, and I saw him praying. Then it means fighting and lots of it, said St. Clair. I'm going to make the best use I can of this little bit of rest, as I don't expect another chance for at least a month. Stonewall Jackson thinks that one hour a day for play keeps Jack from being a dull boy. Just look at our colonels, will you? said Happy Tom. They're believers in what Arthur says. Colonel Leonidas Talbot and Lieutenant Colonel Hector St. Hilaire were sitting in a corner of a rail fence opposite each other, and their bent gray heads nearly touched, but their eyes were on a small board between them, and now and then they moved carved figures back and forth. They're playing chess, whispered Happy Tom. They found the board and a set of men and the captured baggage, and this is their first chance to use them. They can't possibly finish a game, said Harry. No, said Tom, they can't, and it's just as well. Why anybody wants to play chess is more than I can understand. I'd rather watch a four-mile race between two turtles. It's a lot swifter and more thrilling. It takes intelligence to play chess, Happy, said St. Clair. And time, too, rejoined Happy. If a thing consumes a lifetime anyway, what's the use of intelligence? A bugle sounded. The two colonels raised their gray heads and gave the chessmen and the board to an orderly. The four boys returned to their horses, and in a few minutes Jackson's army was once more on the march. The Acadian band near the head of the column playing as joyously as if it had never lost a member in battle. The mountains and the valley between were bathed in light once more. The heavy dark green foliage on the slopes of the Massanuttons rested the eye, and the green fields of the valley were cheering. I don't believe I'd ever forget this valley if I lived to be a thousand, said Harry. I've marched up and down it so much, and every second of the time was so full of excitement. Here's one day of peace, or at least it looks so, said Dalton. But Jackson beckoned to Harry, bade him ride to the rear, and report if there was any sign of the enemy. They had learned to obey quickly, and Harry galloped back by the side of the marching army. Even now the men were irrepressible, and he was saluted with the old familiar cries, Hey, Johnny Reb, come back! You're going toward the Yankees, not away from him. Let him go ahead, Bill. He's going to tell the Yankees to stop, or he'll hurt him. That ain't the way to ride a horse, bub. Don't sit up so straight in the saddle. Harry paid no attention to this disregard of his dignity as an officer. He had long since become used to it, and if they enjoyed it, he was glad to furnish the excuse. He reached the rear guard of scouts and skirmishers, and turning his horse, kept with them for a while, but they saw nothing. Sherborne, with a detachment of the cavalry, was there, and Ashby, who commanded all the horsemen, often appeared. Fremont's army is not many miles behind, said Sherborne. If we were to ride a mile or two toward it, we could see its dust. But the Yanks are tired, and they can't march fast. I wish I knew how far up the Lure Shields and his army are. We've got to look out for that junction of Shields and Fremont. We'll pass the gap before they can make the junction, said Harry confidently. How's old Jack looking? Same as ever. 
that is like a human sphinx well you can never tell from his face what he's thinking but you can be sure that he's thinking something worthwhile you think then i can report to him that the pursuit will not catch up today i'm sure of it i've talked with ashby also about it and he says they're yet too far back harry what day is this harry smiled at the sudden question but he understood how sherborne amid almost continuous battle had lost sight of time i heard someone say it was the first of june he replied no later than that why it seemed to me that they must be nearly autumn do you know harry that on this very day two years ago i was up there in those mountains to the west with a jolly camping party i was just a boy then and now here i am an old man about twenty-three i should say a good guess but anyway i've been through enough to make me feel sixty i promise you harry that if i ever get through this war alive i'll shoot the man who tries to start another look at the fields how fine and green they are think of all that good land being torn up by the hoofs of cavalry and the wheels of cannon if you're going to be sentimental i'll leave you said harry and the action followed the word he rode away because he was afraid he would grow sentimental himself the army continued its peaceful march up the valley and most of the night that followed harry was allowed to obtain a few hours sleep in the latter part of the night in one of the captured wagons it was a covered wagon and he selected it because he noticed that the night even if it was the first of june was growing chill but he had no time to be particular about the rest he did not undress he had not undressed in days but lying between two sacks of meal with his head on a third sack he sank into a profound slumber when harry awoke he felt that the wagon was moving he also heard the patter of rain on his canvas roof it was dusky in there but he saw in front of him the broad back of the teamster who sat on the cross seat and drove hello exclaimed harry sitting up what's happened a broad red face was turned to him and a voice issuing from a slit almost all the way across its breath replied well if little old rip van winkle himself hadn't waked up at last why you've slept nigh on the four hours and nobody in stonewall jackson's army is ever expected to sleep more'n three and that's gospel truth as sure's my name is sam martin but sam you don't tell me what's happened it's as simple as a b c we're moving again and that fine june day yesterday that we liked so much is gone forever the second of june ain't one little bit like the first of june it's cold and it's wet can't you hear the rain pelting on the canvas besides the yanks are coming up too i done heard the boomin' of cannon off there toward the rear oh why wasn't i called here i am sleeping away and the enemy is already in touch with us don't you worry about that sonny don't you be so anxious to get into a fight cause you'll have plenty of chances when you can't keep out of it sides general jackson ain't been expectin you we're up near the head of the line and about an hour ago when we were startin a whiskered man on a little sorrel horse rid up and said which of my staff have you got in there i remember signin one to you last night i bows very low and i says general jackson i don't know his name he was too sleepy to give it but he's a real young feller nice and quiet he ain't give no trouble at all he's been sleeping so hard i think he's pounded his ear clean through one of them bags of meal general jackson laughs low and just a little and then he takes a peek into the wagon why it's young harry kenton he says let him sleep on till he wakes he deserves it then he lets fall the canvas and he ups and rides away and if i was in your place young mr kenton i'd feel mighty proud to have stonewall jackson say that i deserve more rest i am proud but i've got to go now i don't know where i'll find my horse i know and what's more i'll tell an orderly came back with him saddled and bridled and he's hitched to this here wagon of mine good-bye mr kenton i'm sorry you're going cause you've been a nice pleasant boarder sayin nothin and givin no trouble harry thanked him then in an instant was out of the wagon and on his horse it required only a few minutes to overtake jackson and his staff who were riding soberly along in the rain he noticed with relief that he was not the last to join the chief two or three others came up later jackson nodded pleasantly to them all as they came but the morning was gloomy in the extreme harry was glad to shelter himself with a heavy cavalry cloak from the cold rain 
All the skies were covered with sullen clouds, and the troops trudged silently on in deep mud. Now and then a wind off the mountains threshed the rain sharply into their faces. From the rear came the deep, sullen mutter which Harry so readily recognized as the sound of the big guns. Sam Martin was right. The enemy was most decidedly in touch. Dalton handed Harry some cold food, and he ate it in the saddle. Jackson rode on saying nothing, his head bowed a little, his gaze far away. The officers of his staff were also silent. Jackson, after a while, reined his horse out of the road, and his staff, of course, followed. The troops filed past, and Jackson said, We will soon pass the gap in the Massanuttons, and Shields cannot come out there ahead of us. That danger is left behind. What of the junction between Shields and Fremont, General? asked one of the older officers. Jackson cast one glance at the somber heavens. Providence favors us, he said. The south fork of the Shenandoah flows between Fremont and Shields. It is swollen already by the rains and the rushing torrents from the mountains, and if I read the skies right, we're going to have other long and heavy rains. They can't ford the Shenandoah, and they can't stop to bridge it. It will be a long time before they can bring a united force against us. But while he spoke, the mutter of the guns grew louder. Jackson listened attentively a long time, and then sent several of his staff officers to the rear with orders to the cavalry, the Invincibles under Talbot, and one other regiment, to hold the enemy off at all costs. As Harry galloped back, the mutter of the cannon grew into thunder. There was also the sharper crash of rifle fire. Presently he saw the flash of the firing and numerous spires of smoke rising. His own message was to the Invincibles, and he delivered the brief note to Colonel Talbot, who read it quickly and then tore it up. "'Stay with us a while, Harry,' he said, "'and you can then report more fully to the General what is going on. They crowd us hard. Look how their sharpshooters are swarming in the woods and fields yonder.' An orchard to the left of the road, and only a short distance away, was filled with the Union riflemen, running from tree to tree and along the fences. They sent bullets straight into the ranks of the Invincibles. Four guns were turned and swept the orchard with shell. But the wary sharpshooters darted to another point, and again came the hail of bullets. Colonel Talbot bade his weary men turn, but at the moment Sherborne, with a troop of cavalry, swept down on the riflemen and sent them flying. Harry saw Colonel Talbot's lift moving, and he knew that he was murmuring thanks, because Sherborne had come so opportunely. We're not having an easy time, he said to Harry. They press us hard. We've drive them back for a time, and they come again. They have field guns, too, and they are handled with great skill. If I do not mistake greatly, they are under the charge of Carrington, who you remember fought us at that fort in the valley before Bull Run. John Carrington. Old John Carrington, my classmate at West Point, a man who wouldn't hurt a fly, but who was the most deadly artillery officer in the world. Harry remembered that famous duel of the guns in the hills, and Colonel Talbot's admiration of his opponent, Carrington. Now he could see it shining in his eyes as strongly as ever. "'Why are you so sure, Colonel, that it's Carrington?' he asked. "'Because nobody else could handle those field guns as he does. He brings them up, sends the shot and shell upon us, then hitches up like lightning, is away before we can charge, and in a minute or two is firing into our line elsewhere. Trust Carrington for such work, and I'm glad he hasn't been killed. John's the dearest soul in the world, as gentle as a woman. Down, 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 all of you! There are the muzzles of his guns in the bushes again. Colonel Talbot's order was so sharp and convincing that most of the Invincibles mechanically threw themselves upon their faces, just as four field pieces crashed and the shell and shrapnel flew over their heads. That rapid order had saved them, but the officers on horseback were not so lucky. A captain was killed, Lieutenant Colonel St. Hilaire was grazed on the shoulder, and the horse of Colonel Talbot was killed under him. But Colonel Talbert, alert and agile, despite his years, sprang clear of the falling horse and said emphatically to his second-in-command, Lieutenant Colonel Hector St. Hilaire, The last doubt is gone. It's Carrington as sure as we live. Then he gave a quick order to his men to rise and fire with the rifles, but the woods protected the gunners, and when Sherburne, with his cavalry, 
charged into the forest, Carrington and his guns were gone. End of chapter 13, part 1